So thank you and welcome back. <coughs> Wisdom uh, I think a kind of uh, human intelligence that actually I think the one of the unique thing about human brain. The other animals, uh, I think some have a very low degree of intelligence, uh, but we human sort of brain is something really much advanced. So then, I think now, better to be used Tibetan. Uh, so, uh, I think the Buddhist understanding of Tibetan is that uh, or I think ancient accord, according classical, ancient yeah. Indian thought. Yeah. thought yeah. So according to classical Indian thought, um, uh, any cognitive event or any cognitive uh, faculty uh, is recognized as having the capacity to know, to be aware. The Shedan Galea won't be so, however, a distinction is strong between how we acquire knowledge or understanding or awareness um, with relation to our sensory faculties, with engage with the world, and also um, mental experience, experience at the level of mind itself. Mm -hmm. So when we speak about prajna, which is the Sanskrit term in Tibetan name shira, that is translated as wisdom, we are really talking about our ability to know at this second mental level, not at the sensory level. So this faculty so although um, there is an understanding that any mental activity has this capacity to be aware of, to, to engage with the object, however, when we speak of this particular faculty translated as wisdom, this prajna, then we are really talking at the level of a mental experience. So that kind of faculty need not be present, present in all cognitive experiences. So this morning we had a discussion about how there are two primary types of you know, mental processes. One tends to be more in the form of aspiration, yearning and wish and compassion belongs to that class and there is the other category of mental engagement that tends to be more cognitively oriented and wisdom and intelligence and insight belongs to that category. Oh. Uh, so within this domain where 
our mental engagement is much more cognitively oriented where the role of insight and understanding and, and intelligence plays a greater role. And there can be both distorted forms. You know, some, sometimes we can be very sure of a certain you know, understanding that we develop, but it may have no basis in reality. Those are kind of forms of wisdom, but they are kind of distorted forms of wisdom or understanding. But then there could be other forms of understanding which are really more in tune with reality, which are grounded in reality. These are the correct forms of understanding which are referred to as prajna or, or wisdom. So, I think uh, when we carry investigation, then the wisdom side is now implementing, utilizing. So in our daily life, you see that intelligence or wisdom, you see, every time is used. And dream time also, sometimes uh, a, a subject which we much involved in daytime, investigate. Uh, that same sort of kind of investigation may carry in dream. So, so that minimum geshe koriya shirdi mula. So uh, this indicates that this faculty of wisdom or prajna is active even in our dream state. Oh. In fact, I think dream state. The basic mind more subtler than the state of awakening state. Waking state. Waking state. Uh, so, the, if someone, is a, I think some sort of technique, and then maybe the dream state mind may be more sharper for further investigation. So these, uh, these sort of uh, mind or no, intelligence uh, by itself uh, just a neutral. Neutral. Ah, neutral. neutral. Mm. Uh, can be either constructive and destructive. It must depend on motivation. Other factor. Other, other factor. Another factor. And similarly, wishing, right. Similarly, those forms of more aspiring and yearning type of mental states are also very much dependent upon the motivation, whether they can be constructive or negative. So then, Well, actually, I just want you to see the exact meaning of because of psychology. Psychology. What What is the exact meaning? <laughs> uh, I quite often you see use psychology word psychology, psychology. but uh, I don't know the exact meaning. <laughs> I, um, so, so, at, so, at the uh, risk uh, of, uh, uh, <laughs> uh, I am uh, I am expect you see later. I, Later so one of you, yeah. please explain the okay. exact meaning. <laughs> then, uh, see in Tibetan, the psychologist had the Yaoshi Mishnati. Exact meaning, I don't know. So you see, these different uh, mind or thought. Some may belong psychology, some may not, I don't know. So in order to know that, the, it is very essential to know the exact meaning of psychology. Well, the problem is, uh, His Holiness is pointing out that his understanding of this mental phenomena is drawn from classical Indian and Tibetan sources. And when translating across the disciplines, across language, when we use the English term psychology, to what extent it overlaps to the phenomena that the classical text describes and his understanding is based on becomes problematic.
Mm. Yes, that's all. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you. That is a wonderful introduction. And if I may, I'd like to introduce our panelists Oops. this afternoon uh, to you. Um, we can begin with Dr. John Kabat-Zinn, who you know and recently saw in Dharamsala. And uh, he, for people, I think probably most people in the audience know him as well. He's the founder and former director of the Stress Reduction Clinic at the Center for Mindfulness in Medicine, Healthcare, and, Soci and Society at the University of Massachusetts Medical School, where he is also an emeritus professor of medicine. His life work has been dedicated to introducing mindfulness practice into mainstream Western cultures and studying its cl clinical applications. To his left is Dr. Alyssa Eli. She is a psychiatrist on the faculty of Harvard Medical School who is well known for her thoughtful writings about seriously mentally ill patients in the Boston Globe and the New York Times and for her poetic descriptions of clinical work and the suffering of major mental illness on national public radio. Her compassion and wisdom around the power and mystery of listening is reflected in these stories. To my right is Dr. Marsha Linehan. She is the director of the Behavioral Research and Therapy Clinics and professor of psychology at the University of Washington in Seattle. She is renowned as the developer of dialectical behavior therapy, which effectively combines cognitive and behavioral techniques with acceptance and mindfulness practice to treat patients who have difficulty regulating both their emotions and their behavior. And finally, a gentleman who may be able to answer your question about what we think psychology is, <laughs> uh, is Dr. Steven Pinker. He is an experimental psychologist on the faculty of Harvard College. He is world famous for his research on the acquisition and psychology of language, words, visual cognition, and how the mind works. He too has been named one of the 100 most influential people by Time magazine. And related to the topic of our panel, he's interested in the psychological dynamics of war and the limitations of nonviolence. So, to begin our discussion, if I can ask Dr. kabat to lead us off. Well, Your Holiness, it's uh, wonderful to see you again. And um, I would say wonderful to have this kind of gathering uh, under the auspices of the Harvard Medical School. Uh, I feel that you are uh, probably the most important figure in the world right now giving voice to the need for greater compassion and wisdom in the world. Uh, that gives an enormous amount of uh, inspiration to people far and wide uh, to actually uh, inquire deeply as to what wisdom and what compassion would require in this particular state of uh, the world at this moment. So I just want to express my profound appreciation on the part of myself, but also I would say on the part of all of us here for your willingness to take this transformational point position because the world is in so sorry need of what we are inquiring about today. I also dare say that it would be something of a stretch for the Harvard Medical School to actually hold uh, uh, an entire two-day symposium on, um, on meditation and psychotherapy with the subtext of wisdom and compassion without your presence. <laughs> That's not to say it wouldn't happen, but it certainly is catalytic, I would say. So, um, I love that you just brought up the question of uh, what psychology actually is, because uh, we've been sitting here this morning asking you questions about, like, what is the nature of compassion, and what is, we're going to talk about the nature of wisdom, so I think it's only fair that it be di bi-directional. And as you know, when that subject came up in Dharamsala two weeks ago, around emotion, it became very uh, clear to all that even from the Western scientific perspective of the study of emotion, that uh, it's very, very hard to define precisely what emotion is and how it is distinguished from 
cognition or from mood or anything like that. So we are swimming in a sea that uh, is a little bit imprecise. At the same time, we always have to come back to the first noble truth, and that is the actuality of the enormity of the suffering in this world. And uh, whether there are ways for human beings both individually and collectively to address this suffering and certainly psychotherapy is one of the most profound ways that the West has developed for trying to reach out to human beings who are suffering especially at the domain of the mind but since we don't differentiate fundamentally between mind and body it concerns the whole human being and uh, address this suffering and I might say that then there's also the collective suffering of the planet because so much of the destructive energies of the human mind when it doesn't know itself uh, get replicated in the social environment in the banking environment to just to pick something out of the hat uh, or uh, the uh, fate of the planet the danger of the ecology of the planet to human harm so uh, we're really talking here about some things you mentioned this morning which is can we understand something profoundly about the nature of the mind and the nature of reality and when you were asked the question about um, give us one easy meditation that we could do that would just kind of make everything a little bit better uh, I felt you very skillfully said no thank you because <laughs> the human mind is so complex that we don't want to suggest one thing we'll just kind of do it um, so uh, but at the same time you did mention the meditation on impermanence and then you also mentioned uh, deep inquiry into anatta or the nature of the self and so it seems to me that the, the nature of the self and its relationship to impermanence and suffering are very very important in the field of psychotherapy whether we're talking about an individual or we're talking about human behavior on a global scale so my question to you to open up the afternoon's uh, discussion or dialogue is really uh, around the nature of the self and whether when you use the word wisdom there's a particular way in which the perspective of prajna has to do with the nature of reality of what we think of as myself and whether there's some kind of uh, understanding beyond our thoughts about ourselves in other words are we who we think we are or are we something else larger more profound than who we think we are and are there ways to come back to Richard Davidson's question this morning to actually practice or cultivate wisdom hand in hand with compassion sometimes I know they're spoken of as like the two wings of a bird the compassion and wisdom so are there ways that you uh, that you can share with us that might be useful in the domain of human suffering that have to do with the actual deepening and cultivation of wisdom and how it would hold <laughs> compassion. Real complicated. I think firstly, although this is a very, very complicated subject, you know, but I think one obvious thing is, uh, perhaps in, in our, uh, kind of that, uh, in generally, uh, those people who uh, have some kind of, uh, of self-centered sort of equal, egoistic attitude, grasping, you know, I that kind of mm -hmm. strong. 
then such person uh, I think sometimes more sensitive about the other's attitude uh, some nice word come very happy a uh, little uncomfortable word come immediately so much the more that may actually disturb then person who uh, not that much sort of color strong sort of grasping uh, nice word okay good but no not that much sort of color uh, excitement uh, excitement and negative word also okay that kind of, that kind of thing uh, feel attitude that i think happening isn't it mm. so in that case now buddhist explanation is uh, as i mentioned before uh, uh, in the mind or thought i think here we can divide two groups one uh, a negative or destructive which no basis of valid validity no. uh, another uh, constructive based on valid valid, valid, valid grounds so uh, now the the first category first one uh, uh, because based on ultimately ignorance so no valid uh, now ignorance there are many many variety of ignorance uh, but here ignorance is very strong self grasping so self is there nobody can deny that self is there it's a reality but uh, now here appearance and the reality there's always gap so now regarding self appears something independent which owned our body and mind uh, and the reality if we investigate beside body and mind we can't find self as one entity independent separate entity so appears or oh, there could be separate entity reality no so that's the buddhist concept of selflessness so that uh, now the other one you see the, uh, the feeling or self grasping that self something independently exist now that's ignorance now so that based of as basis then other attachment or fear or many things fear also i think uh, the with reasons that's not based on ignorance but much so sort of exaggerated sort of thing fear. fear is very much linked with that ignorance and then attachment i think attachment and that also is we need to use it in because of that precise definition uh, precise definition <laughs> <laughs> but generally you see attachment and desire two separate thing desire now reasonable so the desire. desire with reasons desire now for example here you see everybody have desire to achieve happy joyful life that desire is right and as a buddhist desire to achieve uh, buddhahood that desire is right positive uh, and meantime now here or desire want buddhahood but based on that in grasping self grasping right? grasping that also consider negative right. 
the desire itself right the valid basis but because related based on that grasping sort of the ignorance so it already then it whole thing to the spoil yeah so this is negative so in fact one of the buddhist texts states that uh, if someone engages in a virtuous act based on a very strong sense that i as an independent ego exist mm -hmm. then that pursuit may seem like virtuous but actually it's not virtuous so now here uh, yesterday also I mentioned I feel the faith strong faith unshakable one-pointed faith according to the religion God so tremendous sort of one-pointed faith the, although it's different than the Buddhist sort of wisdom of mm -hmm. Self. Of no, no self. No, no self. Mm -hmm. But some, I think, similar effect. Mm -hmm. The faith towards God. Then, at that time, the it effect. Now, <coughs> self, not important. God, Creator, you are totally sort of what's the day, at disposal or totally sort of devoted. Now. devoted. So some sense of selfless. So that I think, I think, generally speaking, more or less same effect. Effect. Nangchu so for example, in the Buddhist teachings, um, we speak of a practitioner uh, being single-pointed in his or her uh, kind of a reverence to the three jewels, Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha, and that has an effect of releasing this grasping itself mm -hmm. and ego. Similarly, a practitioner who dedicates his entire being, body, speech, and mind, yeah. for the welfare of... Sadhu, Nagarjuna stated, Sadhu, Chudan, Medhanu, Medhanu, Vesengshin, Tadu, Sinjan, Tamjiki, Rangar, Kamri, Jaisa, Shok, Zane, Ego, the Medhu, one. So, for example, a Bodhisattva practitioner who dedicates his or her entire being uh, for the benefit of other sinful beings and dedicates to the service for others, as articulated in Nagarjuna's prayer, where he makes the aspiration May I become like the, you know, elements such as earth, water, fire, and so on, so that all sentient beings can utilize me in whatever way they, they wish. So that kind of dedication can have an impact, effect on releasing this kind of grasping at a, a strong sense of ego, self-centeredness. So these are not uh, wisdom side, but some effect on the egoistic sort of strong egoistic feeling. So now here we need this is a very subtle way distinction. Uh, otherwise, uh, the, uh, on the other hand, you see, in order to uh, dedicate oneself, one's body, mind, mind speech. speech, totally dedicated for well-being of the entire sentient being, you need tremendous sort of will. Mm. Tremendous sort of self-confidence and strong sort of uh, the feeling of what's it? Uh, strong self. self. Sense of self. Love. Sense of self. Otherwise, you can't you can't practice such thing. <clears throat> so strong self. Uh, there are two: one positive or negative. One based on wisdom. One based on ignorance. So we have to make distinction. But yeah, the other word. So, so the real person is. I lost now. Uh, now, theistic religion, according to theistic religion, uh, uh, firstly, 
you see, other some reasons, you see, to, sorry, to, to bring conviction, God. Faith in God. Uh, uh, there, wisdom worked. Uh, then, uh, bring the enthusiasm of practice of compassion and admiration of compassion. So that way, one way. Then non-theistic, again, uh, the knowledge, fuller knowledge about law of causality. That's work for wisdom. So that brings conclusion that they need compassion. Uh, then, this morning, those way, as of the secular way, there also is we need utilize our common sense, our common experience, and latest scientific findings. Through that way, we should bring conviction. These positive emotions are good for oneself, for the society, for the family, like that. So wisdom or intelligence, I mean, any human sort of say, like human thought, which so that related with reasoning, then intelligence or wisdom always now. Thank you, Your Holiness. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. I think it has tremendous relevance to psychotherapy, and it strikes me that maybe the kind of motivation that you're talking about for the great bodhisattva commitment to prajna and to healing all people, serving all people, uh, is something that we might introduce within psychotherapy and bring back into psychotherapy in terms of like a Hippocratic oath for, for psychotherapists. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to uh, <laughs> give Dr. Alyssa Eli an opportunity to speak with you. I am a psychiatrist who sees psychotic patients in a day clinic and two evenings a week I travel to some of the homeless shelters around Boston and see people there. The patients that I see hear voices that speak cruelly to them. They believe they're being punished for crimes they haven't committed. They believe that horrific things will happen to them that are not going to happen to them. And sometimes they, can't re they cannot forget the horrific things that have happened to them. I prescribe their medications, I sit with them, I hold their hand metaphorically, I admire their strength, and I say, hold on, if you just hang on, things will change and get better. If you take your medication, if you come to the clinic, if you don't drink, if you don't use drugs, if you hold on, your symptoms will diminish, your lives will improve. But that is not true. Many of the patients I see have done this for years and their lives have not improved. Their symptoms have not grown better, they've worsened. Their illnesses have not diminished, they have increased. So my question for you, which I ask selfishly but hopefully, is, is there something you can say to me, to us, that we can bring back to our patients to help them whose lives are so difficult, whose lives may not change, and whose lives we ourselves might not be able to endure? Mm.
I think now precise answer for that question is I don't know. <laughs> they like uh, again, this morning I mentioned uh, the individual case. There are some individuals who have some faith. Then, religious faith. Ah, religious religious faith. faith. Then, accordingly, some different approach. Because of the different approach. Uh, even someone who, who are non-believer but still have some sort of respected friend including their parent it can be you see use their name and yesterday I think I mentioned the uh, for example, someone who was loved one, ah, loved one, a loved one, passed away, and too much worry, uh, some that kind of question. So I mentioned my own case, my own experience, and my tutor, senior tutor, uh, passed, away. passed away. At that time. Uh, I felt uh, usually uh, I, ha I had the feeling I have some solid rock to lean on. Uh, to lean on. To lean on. Now that no longer there. So some very disturbances. But then I felt oh, now no use to keep sort of this sort of uh, grief. No. or grief or desperate sort of feeling. feeling. And I remember my late tutor, uh, he wished me a healthy person and something useful, a useful life, meaningful life. Uh, so if I too much worry, too much sadness, uh, he also feel more sad. If I, in spite of his death, I carry his instruction, his teaching, sincerely and without sort of too much disturbance of my mind, that's the best way to serve, to, to, to serve or to, to, serve to present the gift. Uh, to serve his wishes and uh, offer a gift to his wishes. Mm. <coughs> so it's just someone who I think who may, for example, who have very kind mother or father or someone, then remember, now no longer on this planet, but still, uh, you see, if your parent uh, some way knows your condition, you have too much worry, too much desperate sort of feeling, uh, brings more worry, more sadness to your so the loving parents. Uh, things not already happen. There's no way to overcome that. Now, just worry, worry, worry is additional suffering. Uh, think our life. Always there are different aspects. Any reality, many different aspects. So, from one way, uh, from one angle, it is a disaster. But the same event, if you look from another angle, maybe not that kind of disaster. Even some positive things may be there. So that's, I think, important. There's someone who always look from one direction or sad, negative side, <coughs> think negative, negative, worry, 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 worry. Now, I often see, uh, make example, our own case. We lost our own country, a uh, lot of sort of problems. Uh, if you look only that aspect, then more worry, more sadness. 
But if you look from another angle, because of this tragic situation, creates a new opportunity. If I still in Lhasa, Potala, I may not participate here. <laughs> Harvard University sort of some Discussion. discussions. <laughs> and we personally also, you see, there's no opportunity to be with a variety of people. And from, I could learn many, many things. So I myself consider most a holy person in Potala. So I may like that. <laughs> waste, waste of time. <laughs> and remain with distance, rather distance with reality. It's fooling oneself. No use. So the, I think every life, I think when our life go through, okay, then they are uh, smoothly. smoothly, then there is time to pretend. But when you pass through difficult, no time to pretend. You must be realistic. You must accept the reality. So, uh, in a life, the difficulties, difficult period, is very useful in order to become realistic person. I think of this country, for example. I think your ancestors, the first sort of settlers, I think that they really work very hard. So a lot of sort of hardship. So they are, because of hardship, as a person, more tougher than those younger people. And European, European continent also, and Japan also, the younger, younger generation, not experience that kind of say, difficulties. So sometimes their life more spoiled like that. And in Tibetan community, in India also, those elder people who firstly come <coughs> to our settlement and work hard, they are very tough. And for such people, small, small uh, difficulties may not disturb much. Then a spoiled one, small things disturb because of the lot. So therefore, tragedy is good. Uh, it really Kasuta <coughs> Shindrichava. Um it Kasuta Chipsa. So like uh, um so like the like the burning makes the earthen jar uh, firing. Know, firing um uh, earthen jar makes it very tough and strong. In the same manner tragedy makes you grow and become uh, stronger. That does not mean tragedy is good. No, 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 no. <laughs> Must avoid. But, but if something happened, then think that line. It's better. <laughs> Thank, <laughs> Thank you for that uh, very valuable perspective. I'd like to give Dr. Linehan an opportunity to speak with you. Well, I am um, extremely happy to be here. And I want to answer your question. Mm. What is psychology? Mm. Mm. You may have a different answer. Mm. But as a scientist myself, I think of psychology as the science of behavior, including the behavior of the mind. And, um, but I want to say... Um, and um, as psychologists in psychotherapy research are starting to study mindfulness, a colleague of mine that I work with, Alan Marlat, said at a major conference, what are we doing, psychologists, studying this without inviting the people who really understand it, the um, spiritual leaders such as you. 
So I want to, I'm so grateful for you to be here and that Harvard brings together you, the Dalai Lama, with scientists and brings these two together because it is so important. Um, but I want to move to my question. <laughs> I, so, 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 so what is the meaning of psychology? Study of <laughs> <laughs> Then psychology is not mind. No. Psychology is yeah. not a study of mind. It is a study of the mind. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. You study it also, of course. <laughs> Now, your answer, instead of solving problem, create more confusion. <laughs> <laughs> so seems now seems the psychology is some method to investigate mind, not mind itself. <laughs> I see. <laughs> and then this person is psychologically something, something, because of psychologically. Hmm? I don't know. Ask a question. Now, I feel I'm still in the kindergarten. <laughs> <laughs> so you have to learn many things. I don't know. I don't. Might I ask a question? Yes. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I, I develop... Um, the psychological body. So don't ask about psychology. No. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. I develop, uh, uh, psych I'm a psychotherapy researcher. Psychotherapy. And in the research that I do, I treat the most stigmatized patients, uh -huh. the ones no one else wants to treat, uh -huh. because no one sees them as wise at all. Yes. So I, uh, in developing a treatment, told all the patients, and I told my graduate students too, that they have wise mind, the capacity for wisdom. But then, um, and I said, you too can be wise, and you can uh, engage in wise action. And so the patient said to me, well, what is wise action? And how do I know if my behavior is wise. My drug addicts are effective at getting drugs, and they want to know, is that wise? And I looked it in the dictionary, and I couldn't figure it out myself, so I'm really asking you, for my patients, how do you know if behavior or action is wise, and, and how do you how do you determine wise action? I think from the Buddhist viewpoint, uh, one event, one factor, 
uh, whether positive or negative, uh, sometimes it's difficult to, sorry, distinguish, to distinguish, distinguish. from itself. By itself. By itself. So, from the research side, look from the research side, or from motivation side, from other Tangyana did some quality. Gyawala, the Mikiwa Nishalo, the Ngonyi Gyawala, the Mikiwa. Sungdenji Gyawala, the Mikiwa. And Kare. Or Gunungi Gyawala, the Mikiwa. So, uh, Ngonyi Gyawala, the Lokhara Gyawala, the Yachi. So open up this question a little bit because it raises the point about what action constitutes wholesome as versus unwholesome. And in the Buddhist context, um, there's a recognition that some actions may be wholesome by their very nature of the act itself. But there could be other actions which are or wholesome. Or action or mind. Or action or a state of mind which are wholesome by their very nature. But some uh, can be wholesome because of the underlying motivation, the state of mind that gave rise to them. So, in these cases, you may not be, one may not be able to actually define the act itself or the mental itself as wholesome, but rather... So, by itself, you cannot define one way or another, but you can define something as wholesome because of the underlying motivation that gave rise to it. And then some, uh, uh, some uh, mental state or action can be defined as uh, wholesome because of the con concomitant um, state of mind. There may be other mental uh, processes which are present at the same time that support it, and, and that's what makes them wholesome. So then, some action, whether wise or not, but I think I know they should judge from the result of your point. From the point of view of consequence. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, so otherwise, it's very difficult to you know, pick the action itself and say this is wise versus unwise. But you look at the consequences. Yes. Oh. There was some action carried sincere motivation. Sincere motivation. Sincere motivation. So from the motivation viewpoint, it's positive. positive. Wholesome. But since that uh, method become unrealistic method, unrealistic method due to lack of knowledge or awareness about the reality. Mm -hmm. uh, so then the result will be negative. So from the result viewpoint, that action then consider wrong. Unwise. So from research I share somebody. So Gulugchani Gawa so, so therefore, uh, this throws up the complexity of situations where the underlying motivation may be uh, wholesome and then the act, because of the way in which it is done, may result in uh, negative consequences. So from the point of view of consequence, this, the same act is unwholesome and unwise. So that can be uh, possible because things are relative. So this is because everything is depend dependent upon context and relative. So just like long and short, you can only contextually define what is long and what is short. So good and bad, also basically, that's 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 that. Uh, that field. That field. Some good thing compare uh, uh, extremely good thing that this is bad. The bad and the good compare with bad is good. So like that. 
So all, everything you see, because of that. Interconnected. Interconnected. So this, now this is a broad one, which is an uh, important concept. No independent self. Everything related with other, due to other factor. So that, again, very helpful to loosening or grasping. Good is good, is absolute, that loose. Bad is absolutely bad. And should they do those in the Of course, there's the problem that in the end, there will be nothing left to point your finger at. <laughs> <laughs> there is a nihilism. Nothing left to point your finger at. Oh. There is a nihilism. Uh, so now must avoid that. And also the grasping, there's another sort of absolutism. Extreme. No. Extreme. So between there, we call middle way. So the best thing is, then you never do a yinza, then a takwa yinza, yores. Then a takwa yinza, no more That's why in Buddhism, uh, the understanding of the interdependent nature of reality becomes very crucial. Therefore, one's understanding of the reality of anything must be grounded upon appreciation of the, its very interconnected nature. And then this appreciation of the interdependent nature will also help us uh, be released from yeah, at our tendency to grasp at some kind of solidity and absolute reality. Oh. One thing, when I met uh, this is some, uh, some foreigner and also some Tibetans also, Is it due to some tragedy? Is it very too much worry? Uh, for example, is one I think a uh, person who the uh, uh, what's it? Those I mean, the, the people who brought that person is it described him as a mad person. Uh, Then, in, in front of that person, is it they uh, quite loudly is it mentioned? This is mentally is something wrong. That's table now. Oh, mad person. Then I, uh, then I, is it they, uh, told him, uh, doesn't doesn't matter. In a certain level, we everybody mad. So. Oh. In the sense, you see, we are a servant of ignorance. So ignorance dominates our, our mind uh, from the Buddhist viewpoint now. Uh, so we always uh, get the sort of impression, distorted information, so distorted sort of, what's it, uh, appearance. So we uh, take that as a real reality. So we act according to that appearance. So essentially, mad. Deluded love. Deluded love. Deluded love. Mm. So you see, in order to, if you tell, oh, you are mad, It's then his or her, her mind will more sort of discourage, then less willingness uh, to recover or to, to be Respond. another normal human being. So that's, I think, very, very important to, uh, to give any, uh, every encouragement. encouragement. And especially those sort of the prisoners, uh, you see, they treat them as a part of society uh, and part of our community and give them hope and confidence. And through that way, realize their past mistake, but potential to become a normal, good human being. That I feel important. Sometimes the people treat these people more because of that. They don't be inferior. 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 Yes. Uh -huh.
then that I think actually block mm -hmm. the possibility of recover. Thank you. Ad mm. okay. I'd like to give Dr. Pinker an opportunity to perhaps tell us what psychology is or go off in a different direction. <laughs> yes, <laughs> now I'm hoping more precisely about the psychology. I would define psychology as the science of mind, both the science of thinking, how we reason, how we remember, how we imagine, how we speak and understand language, and also the science of emotion, uh, of love and hate and fear, and the moral emotions like anger and gratitude and guilt and uh, compassion and trust. Uh, and I'm going to ask you a psychological question that is very much related to your life's work. You are the world's foremost uh, symbol of uh, nonviolent political change. You are devoted to the idea that the terrible violence and oppression uh, in uh, Tibet will, can change for the better. And in many ways, uh, there are positive signs in history that human behavior uh, can change and that we can become less violent. Over many centuries, uh, humanity has abolished barbaric practices like slavery, and uh, crucifixion and burning at the stake and human sacrifice. Uh, even in the past 50 years, uh, we have seen a reduction in the number of wars between nations uh, and events that would have been deemed incredible just three decades ago, such as the fall of the Soviet empire without a, a major war, the end of apartheid in South Africa without uh, a bloodbath or massacre. So there are optimistic signs. By many criteria, we have become a more peaceful uh, species. The question is, if uh, our biological nature has not changed, we still have impulses toward uh, violence and self-deception and impulsiveness and, uh, and greed. Uh, what are the positive aspects of human nature that have been engaged over the centuries and decades? Uh, is it a widening sense of empathy so that we don't just feel compassion for our own uh, clan or family, but for larger and larger groups? Is it inhibition and self-control? Is it passing justice from our own biased selves to disinterested third parties like the rule of law and government? Is it trade and exchange where globalization makes it more profitable to cooperate with people than to invade them? There are many possibilities for what parts of the mind are increasingly engaged. What do you think those parts of the mind are and how uh, can we best engage them to continue the progress toward uh, nonviolence in human history? Correct. That's my favorite subject, Ray. Right? <laughs> oh. uh, basically, Human nature, I believe, more gentle, gentleness, or more compassionate. The reason, biologically, the, at, the, uh, at the time of our birth, I think, uh, the mother ready to provide milk, care. Uh, so that moment, the dominant, uh, uh, dominant force, dominant emotion in our mind 
is love. Tremendous sort of affection to that person who provides us of nourishment, right? And, uh, nurturing. Nurturing. Including milk. Uh, although that time, I think the cognitive, more detailed cognitive sort of mind not yet developed. So, uh, uh, the, the child may not have the knowledge, this is my mother, but simply biological factor, totally rely. And so long, uh, remain with that, feel happy, separate, uh, uncomfortable, fear. And so at that time, aggressiveness, even though occasionally maybe, maybe, but dom dominant, not dominant, very clear. So affection, whole 24 hours. Uh, and since our life started that way, uh, and very nature, our survival entirely depend on others' care. Uh, in order to bring that energy to caring uh, boy or children, Child, yeah. uh, the, the mother's side need uh, some kind of tremendous will. Uh, that brings by affection. So that by nature now. I often used to telling people, uh, my, one my curiosity, like you see turtle, some turtle, or butterfly, uh, or some other some f uh, the species of mammals, uh, whose youngsters survival not depend on mother's care. Those animals, if we put together the youngster, for example, the youngster, turtle youngster, turtle, and his mother put together, I don't think the both sides have the capacity to show affection. It's not necessary. Survive by itself. So we bronze the other type. Is it caring uh, by mother? Depend entirely on mother. Birds, some sort of possibly animal like cats, dogs, all the all these. So we bronze that. But particularly we need milk. Like that. So because of that, biological factor. Now the scientists, uh, <laughs> the scientists are my guru now. You see, they, you see, they found the uh, compassionate mind very good for our health, good health I mean, for our body element, and peace of mind go very well. Agitated mind not go well. So therefore, our body, uh, basic nature of body, much more closer to calm mind. Compassion brings calm mind. Anger destroys our calm mind. Very clear. So therefore, appreci appreciation of love compassion by nature. And effect, compassionate attitude, I think full of compassion, I think little chance uh, as of the tell a lie with compassion and motivation brings honesty, truthful, justice. With anger motivation, Cheating, lie, bully, all these negative verbal actions as, well as well as physical actions. So therefore, our basic nature is, I believe, 
more compassionate. Compassionate, very much need for our health, for our life. That's a dominant force. Therefore, all actions, verbal action, physical action, which closer that mind is by nature we appreciate. So in the society, I know truthful, whether educated or uneducated, or Eastern or Western or Southern or poor or rich, everybody appreciate truthful, honest. But wait. So therefore, war, concept of war, uh, is an act of bully. No. Uh, motivated, in most cases, anger, hatred. Uh, I think through experiences out of war, out of violence. During the 20th century, we human beings, humanity, I think gain much more experiences. Result, as I mentioned before, we become more mature. So we realize our own mistake. So I think tendency more kasoda towards more kasoda, more peace, non-violence. Uh, non-violence, of course, bound to happen because our problem is still there. Always, the problem is bound to happen. So, the, the, that problem uh, not to bring violence, but some way to solve that problem. That's non-violence. So, so long problem there, the concept of non-violence, very much re relevant. Thank you, Your Holiness. So, I think the uh, last sort of the Hazore, I think one <laughs> encouraging sort of statement or expression, the late Queen Mother, the British, uh, British Queen Mother, Queen Mother uh, 1996, her own uh, age. Uh, 96. So at that time, I had opportunity on audience. Uh, since my childhood, uh, her picture, and that fan, the lady, is very, very familiar in my uh, in, in my mind. Uh, and also, her husband. Uh, during the Second World War, uh, I think very. I think a very nice person. So in any way, uh, in any way, so I had some sort of keen desire to meet her. For one of the audience with her. So when I met, uh, I asked her, since the, uh, the most part of this 20th century, you witness. So humanity, we, uh, becoming more better or more or less remain same or worsen. Without hesitation, she mentioned better. Then she mentioned, when she was young, no concept of human right, no concept of self-determination. Nowadays, these become universal value, she mentioned. I think, I think this quite has Authentic statement, I think. Mm -hmm. One lady, not a politician. <laughs> then very old, mm -hmm. so not much sort of concern about her future. So I think she honestly she mentioned these things. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I believe, I believe, Your Holiness, that it's sad for us. Uh, it's time for you to okay. move on. There are other people who are very much looking forward to meeting with you today. And for the, speaking for the entire group, I'd like to thank you so much for coming and joining us. Thank you. So perhaps I think... Oh, yes, okay. Great to see you.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. You? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Special thank, or bring bring more confusion. So special thank. <laughs> What do you say? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The day bolts go. Thank you. No, no. I, you earlier you gave me one. If you really? like. Really. <laughs> oh, okay. But I thank you. Nah, nah. <laughs> okay. <Or better. laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Your Holiness. Thank you for a wonderful day. Thank, Thank you. you for coming. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Oh, that's very kind of you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.